I'd like to take a moment before I start to acknowledge that we are here today on stolen land belonging to the Mississauga New Credit First Nations, a part of the ongoing colonial project in Canada. Institutions, like post-secondary, like gal art galleries, may be planted like flags to become the evolving generative machines of history for which they were so designed, but it is the land its peoples and their survivance and its colonial, colonial erasure that we must acknowledge as well here today. Uh, I realize this looks kind of pretentious. I feel like I should be reading a Dickensian novel to you. Um, I'm actually very glad that this chair is here, uh, partly because I spent the week battling the flu, so uh, I think it actually presents relevance, uh, a relevant layer to what I'll actually be speaking about today. I suppose I should tell you who I am. I am a storyteller. It was what I was born to do. It's what I'm good at, and in the process of my still novice earthly existence, I've been learning what that means for someone living in the 21st century. And yes, someone who looks and thinks like I do. This is where I will pause, pretend to drink some water, and then disappoint you by revealing that no, this is not going to be a tale of personal triumph and inspiration. But I have to situate disability there, as I do embody it, both physically and as a key propellant in my work. There are those who use metaphors, individuals who have shared what it means to walk in the world like we do, who leave you with the promise of a renewed hope in the human spirit, revealing that despite the extreme and ugly vitriol that humans prolifically bestow upon one another, that love, whatever fleeting and elusive concept that is, can, uh, can absolve it all and inspire us to find blessing in exactly what we were given. But that, I'm afraid, evades everything worth me being here to talk to you about. And to answer the question of a third grade classmate of mine, no, I'm not related to Terry Fox. It's funny. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the thing is, I only have 18 minutes and I'd rather cut the crap. I'm a little bit more of a Bob Dylan meets Slavon Jigit kind of figure anyway. Love is chaos. I am who I am because of chance and context and timing and a wonderful mother named Leslie seated somewhere in the audience while you can cover your ears for a second. I'm hardy, I get laid, I've had meaningful experiences, I've written bad poetry about it. The reason I'm up here at all is only a matter of perspective in this room. Go back to me telling you who I am. I am an artist. In fact, I was raised in a small town not too far from here, Oxbridge, Ontario. I didn't grow up wanting to be an artist. I had the talent and the inspiration, sure, but art was not reflected in the economy around me as a respected and laudable career. How was art contributing to the intellectual community? Art, as I understood it, was beautiful things to look at, not potent ideas, revolutionary ideas. But despite my best efforts, art continued to nag at me through my adolescence and young adult, adult life. My path eventually landed me here at Trent University in Peterborough, studying English literature. Oh, the humanities. River to be dying as the, as the dawn of the digital age creeps up around us. I find, I find that one endlessly funny because I think I, I probably studied one of the most useful, if not enjoyable things a person can study, the art of rhetoric. And after all, isn't that why TED is so popular? But what does TED do? Is TED actually changing the world, or is it merely a hyperlinked platform for inspiration and entertainment? I'm not trying to be hard on TED, because truthfully, I'm critical of every platform I am given. And TED carries with it not only the prestige, but the prolific ubiquity of the internet. My passion, if you haven't already guessed, is disability, whether through my writing or art. It is a daily lived experience that is intricately tethered to an understanding of how we exist. The internet has illuminated the idea of networks versus locations. Deleuze and Guattari speak to this well, using their idea of assemblages to dispel the false human notion of the autonomous sexual self. 
it reveals that we are an interdependence of factors, all living together as one thing and many things. If I lose a limb, I still exist. If I gain a prosthetic, I have it multiplied, whether that prosthetic be in the form of a care worker, an artificial limb, or a smartphone in my hand. They sat around and accessing media all day and talking about it, and nothing ever seemed to get done. This is a quote from Canadian speculative fiction writer William Gibson from his no novel All Tomorrow's Parties. Its sentiment echoes the greatest dystopian criticism of the social media generation. In fact, it echoes the recent criticisms that Benjamin Grattan had regarding the inefficiency of TED in actually doing the rig rigorous work of propelling us forward. The new idea is to be housed inside all these delightfully designed technologies. But I would argue that these rigorous ideas are already present, but have merely remained invisible from within pre-existing frameworks of knowledge and power. As soon as the internet came to life, disability culture was born. Not disability as radical politic, not the amazing, seldom seen political history, but disability culture, an inherently crip, abbreviation of cripple, uh, Savorian way to engage across barriers that previously isolated an embodiment, allowing it to, it to connect to itself. Let me explain. Before 2001, I did not talk to anyone else with a disability, unless I was going to the hospital. And this wasn't a chameleon. We were there in a physical structure to deny our, our non-normative corporeal, corporeal embodiments as ridiculously as we could. Hey Dave, how's it going? You here for a tune-up? <laughs> Before 2005, I had not spoken to anyone with my particular condition, which is a rare one in 150 million, so approximately 65 cases worldwide. Before 2006, you couldn't find me on Google. Before 2007, I had not had sex. Before 2008, I had not ever met another person who identified as queer and disabled. Before 2010, I had, not, I had not been engaged with by the mainstream about my art, dismantling ableist infrastructures. Before tw uh, 2011, I had not had sex with another physically disabled person. Before 2012, I had not understood what all of this had to do with digital networks. All of the community I've been granted access to has birthed itself through our evolving understanding and negotiating with the internet. I don't just live in Toronto, Ontario. I live anywhere there are messages, Skypes, views of my work. It's all a network of possibility. But it's integral to understand here that this communion exists in spite of our uh, institutions and colonial legacy. Sure, I'm famous now, you can Google me, but I still get invited to events, facilities, lectures, lecture halls, where there's perhaps accessible seating for a portion of students and patrons, but the lectern and stage itself does not expect to need a ramp to require access. So now I will tell you a story. Um, in my Bob Dylan Crip Kerouac-like adventures, uh, giving, giving speeches and having adventures, um, I was invited to speak at the grad conference at Yale, and immediately every fantasy I had about the Dead Poets Society rushed to my mind. <laughs> I'd never been to an Ivy League school, I'd only really dabbled in New York City, uh, and so I readily said yes, they could only pay me for the bus fare, but I was just over the moon about it. Uh, I was actually dealing with a knee injury at the time, but I went anyway, and I had this pretty badass cane. Um, and I got very clear instructions from a friend of mine of what to do once I got off the train uh, in New Haven. And she was like, okay, you have to hop on the shuttle. There's a set of shuttles that it's free, they go directly to Yale, and then I'll meet you on the campus. So I was totally stoked. I'm really good with directions, and I found the shuttle, waited until it got there, like, grinning. And then I got on the shuttle, and I sat down on the front row, because I'm keen like that. And <laughs> about two seconds later, the bus driver kind of leaned back and looked at me, he's like, you looking for the hospital shuttle? <laughs> now, yes, oh, <laughs> poor little disabled kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. The thing is, if I had been in my home city and I was having a bad day, yeah, I probably would explore. I probably would have been a little annoyed. But I was so ecstatic to be, to be going to Yale. I was like, no, I'm going to Yale. And he was like, oh, oh. 
and uh, he decided to try and cover up his error by then asking the entire shuttle if anyone was looking for the hospital. <laughs> which is really funny. Um, but that's just one of a myriad of examples where when focusing on the actual, <laughs> looking at disability in a place in a place of power, it's, it's not something we expect. Also, given this stage, uh, it's very well able to accommodate me, but the stage itself is the only thing in this entire room that's inaccessible. Um, I, I recently, and it's not, it's not just Fred, I recently was on a panel specifically for artists with disabilities at Tiffco Lightbox, and I get in the room, and they're like, you need the ramp? It's in back. I was like, oh, okay, with the livestock? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Uh, I'm, so I'm allowed to consume art, education, even medical care, but I am not expected to provide it. My voice is lauded, yet I am constantly asked and expected to work for free. My work is in textbooks, master's theses, and re research studies. Art is the powerful tool I never imagined it could be as a kid, but my survival seems to be worth a lot less. A few months ago, I learned of the death of crip fighter and artist Lisa Gufano. In the 20th century model of things, she was a stranger to me. But in 2013, she was in the photos of a close friend on a trip to an art museum in DC, posing with a community of gimpy hands, which I liked on Facebook and smiled at. She is in a representation of community I have experienced several times now, IRL, in real life, and digitally on the daily. She was someone who mattered to my existence in a way that didn't exist in our consciousness in 2001. And maybe no, none of you in the room are disabled, but since one of my Canadians is, that's highly unlikely. Uh, so maybe you can't quite appreciate what it's like to be on <laughs> an only disabled person dance floor watching a train of eight wheelchairs whiz by to the moves of Michael Jackson's thriller, but let me assure you, it's pretty friggin' cool. <laughs> The crypt curation of the internet is a limitless and global project that goes on daily. The largest participatory, participatory and barrier smashing purview of its kind. American Able, a photographic series I collaborated on three years ago that rocked clothing company American Apparel, recently started trending on Twitter and Facebook all over again. Many people mistook the disability scoop interview that I did as a recent article, assuming the work was uh, presently, currently being curated on the digital subway screens in some nebulousness known as Toronto, Ontario. It doesn't matter that they are mistaken because the work's format was influenced by fashion advertising's imagery adaptation to digital realities. We relate to ad space in the same manner, and that has not changed since the work surfaced. Only now, three years later, the ableist outrage that the series' original debut inspired is buried deep within the catch pages of the ether and is irrelevant to the experience of the shares today. Anyone working in the art world can tell you that framing is everything. It is not enough to fight to be good, to fight to create great art, because if at the end of the day some curator or some journalist puts your reinvention of the universe back in the same box you just destroyed, then the work means nothing. I work on a digital storytelling project that brings together communities of women with disabilities and differences to share stories and then transform them into a digital, think two to three minute YouTube style format. Uh, and last spring, uh, last spring during one of those said workshops, I was joking uh, with a friend of mine who was a colleague um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of a unique experience to, to be in a space that's majority disability, because a lot of different kinds of stories come out. And so I was joking with her. This is a, yet another coincidental but relevant prop. I was joking with her about coffee cups, to-go coffee cups. And I often get lovingly teased by my friends for having a coffee cup with a straw in it. And the whole, oh my god, don't you grind your mouth? And for the way that my mouth works and functions, I find it a lot easier and a lot less drool prone uh, if I use a straw. And it's a handy thing and I don't burn my tongue. So I, was, I asked my friend, hey, are you able to do those takeout blades? And she 
slapped her leg. I was like, ha, no. And I was like, yeah, me neither. I use a straw. And she was like, you need a freedom tube. <laughs> and I was like, what did you just say? And she just smiled at me. And all of a sudden, this innocuous object that had been a part of my daily routine, and that was very individual to me in its process, was like, go, go, go. You know when you do those montages in your head, and all of a sudden you're just picturing it in all these different contexts? And it reminded me of a close friend of mine who is a, a legend of his own in uh, the Canadian disability art world, uh, Kazumi Soroka. And Kazumi and I bought it many a late night, uh, sitting on the floor of, his, of our studio that we shared together. And uh, he, would, he would be working away, uh, rehearsing Otis or Sinatra, and he'd be sitting on the floor near his chair with a pot on the ground and a tall can of Budweiser with a straw in it. And that was immediately what I thought of when she said, freedom to I was like, yeah, freedom to <laughs> And so we'd be late working, and Kazumi would start to get tipsy and start going on a little dress in the 70s, telling me all about the movement in Toronto, and then every so often, <laughs> Yep, can you get me another beer? <laughs> yes, Kazumi. Uh, but it became this, I, this object that I then, as a, as a visual artist, immediately connected to. And so I wasn't able to sleep after she had said that to me. I kept imagining straws, the classic red and white bendies, thousands of them in front of me, sitting, creating uh, long strands of piping, weaving them together in a sort of tapestry. The straws becoming a network of straws, one for every cup of coffee, one for every daily adjustment to make bodies fit. And with patience and the passing of time, the mundane, the mundane ritual becoming something larger. Together, and, and so I ended up using that concept and applying it with it uh, and spending some time on Toronto Island last summer, actually uh, being able to fulfill this sculptural project and leaving it on the beach and thinking about histories of communities of women and, and the intersection uh, of disability and, and the home. And I spent, yeah, a lovely, a lovely August last summer thinking about that and thinking about disability and networks and embodiment and just threading, like, like an excited child, just threading all these bendy straws. And then during the open studio, uh, inviting uh, people who visit me and my work and participate as well and talk and have communion around, around stories. And so together the straws became a structure arching around itself like a tunnel, like a, la uh, like a large straw itself, a symbol of culture uh, and an honoring of an invisible tradition. <laughs>